morning, everyone. So glad you're here. Um, I'm really glad that we have the North Carolina Public School Forum with us today. Keith Poston has been a friend for many years. Keith used to work with Time Warner Cable. Back in the day, we worked very closely together. Uh, the Public School Forum is probably one of the best sources of information in our state to provide us with the information from Raleigh. Uh, he has his staff Joe here with him today. Um, but what we want to do today is we really want to be solutions oriented. So we're going to share some data, and then after we go through the data, we have a great panel. Uh, we have Desmond Blackett, a teacher from Olympic High School, also a Mecca teacher of excellence. We have Dr. Chance Lewis from the UNC Charlotte Urban Institute and our superintendent, Ann Clark. So we have a strong panel. We're really excited about this, but today is about sharing some information but then also, what can we do? Uh, I want to show you a slide that compares Mecklenburg County to the three other largest counties in North Carolina, which are Durham, Mecklenburg, and Lake. And this is the percent of uh, county property tax revenues that are dedicated to public <coughs> schools. And you might find this interesting in Mecklenburg County, which has the largest uh, collection of taxes based upon our, the size of our community, the wealth of our homes, that we are actually the lowest in percentiles given towards public schools. However, I think it is important to note that we are trending in the right direction. Now, <laughs> well, I, I do think it's fair to, to share that, but at the, same, at the same time, I think it's also important to note that Mecklenburg County spent more money um, for some social programs, uh, spent more money for parks, and there's some other things, so it's not quite as simple as it, it looks, but we are clearly behind our counterparts, okay? Um, I think this is probably a very telling statistic. And I'm going to show you another graph that really bears this out well. The percent of the North Carolina budget that's actually devoted to K-12 education, you'll note that it's dropped significantly. Now, we have elected officials that will tell us and tell you that we spent last year, and that may be true, but North Carolina continues to grow. So we continue to add students, but the actual percentage has dropped, and it's dropped significantly when we compare it back to 09-10 to 13-14. This is a great slide, uh, and this is a slide that CMS put together, and this shows if we were funding where we were back in 2002, 2003, how much more money would be coming to our school district. The graph on the left is the state. And back in 2003, 41.5% of the entire state budget went to K-12 education. You can see in 14-15 that dropped significantly to 38.1%. And while that's only a couple of percentage points, the dollar amount is huge. That's $700 million that aren't coming to K-12. And then if you look to the slide on the right, that's a local slide. That's Mecklenburg County, our county commissioners. And back in 2003, it was 37.1%, now it's 34%. So we sometimes get tricked by dollars and not percentages. So what we're trying to do is just share with you the data, and then you can draw your own. I love this slide, and CMS deserves a lot of credit for this because this makes it real. You can look at the black numbers, and you can look at the red numbers. The black numbers are the good numbers if you're a teacher, the red numbers are the bad numbers if you're a teacher. If you look back to July 2009, and let's take an average teacher salary of 35000 which is actually on the low, but you look at the increase in health benefits, there's 523 dollars came out of teachers' pockets. July 2010, another increase in health care. 11-12, uh, another increase in health care. Then in 2012-13, there was a raise. It was a 3% state local raise, which came to about $1,000. Then we have 13, uh, another increase in health care. 14, another increase in health care. And then 14-15, there was a state salary increase of $500. But the net, a decrease. And so the reality is, is that teachers who took home less. They took home less, and as you and I both know in our own households, that cost
costs increased. I don't know if when you go to the grocery store, things are less money than for me to know. Um, especially if you shop at Whole Foods, it's really good. Uh, here's my last slide. This goes to show, and this is what Keith is going to talk about. This is the us comparing ourselves to the three other largest counties and looking at teacher turnover rates. There are a couple of things we want to look at. We want to pay attention to the number of veteran teachers that are leaving. We want to pay attention to the numbers of young people choosing not to go into the profession. And then another number we're starting to pay attention to is out-of-state folks that used to come to our state and aren't coming anymore. So that's our topic today. Our topic is the teacher pipeline. Uh, Keith has some other very important facts, and then we're going to open it up to our panel. We want the majority of this session to be about Q&A and uh, search for solutions. Keith, come on. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, we are proud to partner with you back on this board, serving one of our most valuable partners across the state. As uh, Bill said, I'm Keith Poston, the President and Executive Director of the Public School Forum of North Carolina. It's a job that I was honored to uh, start uh, early last year, so I'm still fairly new. I guess I can't uh, sort of fall back on the fact that I'm new after a year, but uh, about a year and a half. But it's been an exciting and interesting time um, to be involved in public education, certainly not uh, without its challenges. I also come to you as being the, the brother and the uh, son of the public school educators in Cumberland County, as well as the father of the public school student in Wake County. So I certainly am very aware, just from my own personal relationships and family about some of the issues that are going on. But as Bill said, what we try to do at the Public School Forum in North Carolina, and one of the reasons why um, we are out here today in Charlotte partnering with, uh, with Mech Ed and what we hope to be doing, you know, ongoing over the next year or so, is to go out across the state, you know, not just in Charlotte, but in Greensboro and Asheville and Wilmington and Fayetteville and Wilson, and really sort of elevate and talk about these issues because oftentimes uh, in these communities, uh, like you have here in Charlotte, you're very keenly aware of the local uh, stress points. I mean, you see what the issues are. We'll talk about the challenges and things that are coming with the local funding. You hear about things in your own school. But what we want to do is help connect the dots about what sort of where are these things coming from. You know, what the, what decisions that are being made in Washington and the effect they have on Raleigh. Decisions that are being made in Raleigh and what happens here in the oil areas. We think that's important. And I'm going to throw some more numbers at you and stats. But I, what I really want to do is I'm trying to tell you a story. I want you to, if you don't go to get away from anything else today, is to understand that this, uh, our crumbling teacher pipeline in North Carolina is real. Uh, this is not something um, that, uh, you know, that we're making up or the school leaders are making up in order to talk about teacher compensation or funding. It is something that uh, uh, Ann Clark, I know, will talk about. Uh, I know in my own uh, county school system, we see the same issues. And some of these issues with not just uh, local shortages of teachers, but in certain specific subjects, and it gets worse when you get outside the larger school districts. This is a chart that kind of gives you an overview from a state level. You can see where the trends are. We were in 2009-2010 statewide at about 11% turnover uh, across the state, and it, it peaked at 14.3 last year. We saw a little bit of a dip. Um, let's hope that that's a trend in the other direction, but I, I'm going to suggest to you that it is a one-year aberration and, and really not an indicative of what we may see if we don't get, you know, get down to the business of looking and building and rebuilding our teacher pipeline. I think sometimes percentages, Bill mentioned the, uh, you know, looking at the real numbers can sometimes be misleading. I actually think looking at the real numbers when it comes to the number of teachers is actually pretty eliminated because 14%, I don't know, that sounds like a high number, but when you, when you put that in what that means, that's 13,000 teachers that left the classroom. Here at CMS, that's 1,300 teachers. So every time one of those teachers leaves, that's another teacher that has to be hired. And that's before you add in the enrollment growth. So I think that it's important to sort of keep, a, you know, keep an, an idea when you hear a number like 14%, we're talking about thousands of new teachers that are needed every year. Now this is, um, this is the breakdown by counties. Now I've got CMS there in the middle. The, the turnover rate has increased from 11% in 2009 to 15% last year. Now, we included um, some other counties in here because I know you're familiar with the term the canary in the coal mine. I've kind of been watching these numbers from other counties. And you see, if you look at, um, 
you look at Washington, Washington County schools and Golden City schools. Look at Washington and Golden City. Four years ago, not even four years ago, they were at 12 percent, 17 percent. Today they're at 34 percent, 32 percent. Anson County, 14 percent to 20 percent. So my concern is, if you look at it, if you look at at like Durham County and CMS, where they've gone up just a little bit, what happens when the 12 percent go to 30 percent, and then the 30 percent go to 50 percent? Or when you start, you know, it, it used to be sort of assumed that, well, you know, we know there's some teacher issues and some teacher recruitment problems in some of the more rural counties and some of the lower wealth counties, but these, these issues, and I'm sure the AMP will talk about it, they're affecting Charlotte, too. I mean, they're affecting Wake County, too. They're affecting places that actually have additional resources to pay supplemental pay to provide better resources for the teachers. And we're going to get into some solutions, but I just, um, just sort of look at where those trends are going. We're going to talk a little bit about where the teachers come from, but I think this is one reason why we talk about the UNC system a lot. It's not just because I'm a proud Chapel Hill graduate. Um, it's because that's where most of our teachers come from. The vast majority of teachers, new teachers, all teachers in North Carolina come from the UNC system, from the School of Education. The remainder come from the United States. Well, we get some phenomenal teachers from our North Carolina independent colleges, universities, and our private schools. Entry. And I think that I would put this to say we need to have multiple <coughs> entry rates. We're going to talk about that when we talk about some of the possible solutions. But I think it's important to know when we, when we start talking about the declines in the role of teacher prep in the UNC system, this is the, the numbers that are getting out. And some of these are on some of the charts, I believe. And again, I would encourage you to look at the website that we set up. We'll have some more of this information on uh, edtalk.nc4. Here's the declines just in the UNC system school for education. Started in 2008, and went down. You can see that overall the trends are not good. Um, in fact, I will note uh, there was a story if you go to our Twitter feed. I know I tweeted it out yesterday. Um, the school of education, which we're going to give you some real numbers, uh, the UNC Board of Governors on, just last week eliminated 46 degree programs across the UNC system. 26 of those were education. Um, and I, I, could, I couldn't help but be struck by looking at the number of programs that were eliminated, how many were education programs, and within those, how many of those were mathematics programs, science programs, special education programs. Again, the very ones that superintendents across the state are telling us that they're having problems still. So um, I think that we've, um, we've got work to do. This is a pretty graphic uh, illustration. This is from 2008 to 2013. This is the number of declines in enrollment in bachelor's degree education programs. You'll see uh, some of our you know, really legendary teacher programs like Appalachian State, NC State, here at UNC Charlotte, UNC Charlotte, I can all the UNC Greenberg. These are, again, when I think about the teachers in um, my daughter's schools and the teachers that I grew up with in Fayetteville, a lot of these came from these same schools. Here's the, here's the big list if you want to see. You know, this is your favorite school on there. This is actually 2010 to 2013. But again, I go back, look, look, look at the actual numbers. Um, not just the percentages, 36%. Every one of these schools, I mean, that's you know, 300 plus teachers, 400 plus teachers. And the scary thing to me is this is the enrollment of 2010 to 2013. So we haven't even begun to see that decline. I mean, these are students that would have been graduating, you know, in 2015, 16, 17. One of the things that I, I'm sure I'll probably mention on our, when we're on a panel discussion, I think those of you who are familiar with the public school forum know that uh, up until this year we had uh, administered and led the North Carolina Teaching Fellows Program. And Jane Norwood, my friend, is here today. She was our last commission chair of the Teaching Fellows Commission, but that's 500 teachers every year that are coming out of that program that was eliminated by the General Assembly in 2011. And that last class graduates this month. Um, and so that's another 500 teachers that were entering the, the uh, public schools in North Carolina and the last group of those come out this year. So that's another hole in the pipe. This is, a, this is a study that the Department of Public Instruction does every year that look at the asset contents. Where are the areas you're most concerned about as far as hiring? And as you can see, again, this is for where they rank in there. This is what you'll see consistently over the last several years. It's math and special ed. Those are really where the big issues are. Again, I go 
coming back to the point that some of the programs that were limited to address some of those issues. So. Last but not least, I think this is my last slide, the, uh, the I call it the leaky teacher pipeline. This sort of gets to the issue of persistence within the classroom. Um, this, if you look at the very top, the UNC system is probably a little bit hard to read, but if you, for teachers that stay for three years or stay for five years or longer, the UNC system is at the top of 85%. I'm sorry, 80, it's just about <coughs> on par with the independent college universities of 85, 86%. So the, the students who are from North Carolina, who grew up here and went to college here, are the ones who are most likely to stay here. Uh, and then it kind of goes down from there. But this is just something to keep in mind as we look at alternative uh, entries. I think that uh, what we'll probably talk about today is that there, are, there needs to be different ways to get into the classroom, but we need to be thinking about sort of which ones will address this long term. Finally, we want to talk. I want to show you a slide about teacher salary. We're not going to we're not going to spend the entire panel talking about salary, but I think it is something that we have to talk about because we know it is a, it is affecting um, both teacher morale as well as our ability to recruit and retain teachers. North Carolina, even given last year's increase, we are dead last in this country in terms of declines in teacher salary. This is average teacher salary. This is where the, the nation has gone since 2009. Line, and this is where one of the going in terms of average teacher salary. And you want to bring it closer to home? I mean, this is what it says it all. Right now, even considering last year's uh, step in the right direction with teacher pay, our average teacher salary in North Carolina remains lower than Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. And these are teachers that we are losing. And we'll talk about Great. At this point, I'd like to invite our panel to come up and have a seat here. And as we get started, um, I'd like to let the three panelists who you haven't heard from just give a brief introduction, and we'll start with our superintendent, who we're honored to have here with us, Anne Clark. Good morning, I'm Ann Clark, and I have not failed to um, issue this invitation in every public gathering that I've had. So some of you have had multiple opportunities to think about your role as CMS recruiters. So let me just start by saying I know every person in this room knows a teacher that doesn't teach in Mecklenburg County. And if every one of you left today and made a contact with that teacher and invited them to think about CMS, we would be changing some of the statistics right here on the slide that we just looked at. Every single time I've said this, at least one person, if not more, has come forward and given me a resume or name. And so far, I'm batting 100% on getting those folks to Mecklenburg County. So if you think this is just pie in the sky, it really does work. And everyone in this room is on the CMS recruiting team. We do have our entire CMS recruiting team here this morning, uh, but they're a small team uh, to be hiring for 18,000 employees. So I really invite you, if you listen to our conversation and participate, to look in the mirror and see what your role is to help be a part of the CMS recruiting team. It is the only way um, we're going to fight uh, some of the odds that are on the screen. Um, my name is Desmond Blackett. Um, I teach at the Community Olympic at uh, Olympic Schools. I'm one of five entertaining schools, of course. I teach at the School of uh, ELED, Executive Leadership and Entrepreneurial Development. This is my ninth year. I'm about to enter into my tenth year, and it's just amazing to be here today. Um, I'm looking forward to an answering any questions from a teacher standpoint. And um, once again, thank you to Bill. Uh, good morning. My name is Chance Lewis. I currently serve as the Belt Distinguished Professor of Urban Education at UNC Charlotte. I'm a former high school teacher from the state of Louisiana. I uh, taught there for four years. It was honored to receive Teacher of the Year for the state during my time there. And my work now is focused on uh, writing and publishing about recruitment and retention of teachers of color in the nation's school districts. So as we get started, I'd like to start with those three panelists first uh, and, and talk a little bit about, you, you've, you've seen the numbers. Let's talk anecdotally what we're, what we're seeing and feeling 
uh, in terms of teacher recruitment. And I'd like to start with Desmond kind of on the micro level at the school level. And, and can you talk, Desmond, a little bit about um, how you personally and your school has felt this teacher pipeline squeeze? Um, and then I'd like uh, Ann to talk a little bit about the district and then Chance to talk kind of a, from a macro level uh, about what, what you all are seeing in, in your experience. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, it's been disheartening in the sense to see teachers come and go. Like I said before, this is my ninth year teaching in the school district. I came from the pathway of um, the corporate industry and the banking industry um, through what we call lateral entry. Um, and I love what I do. Um, we're pretty much in the trenches now because as you see at the numbers, we have not had a, a big increase as composed or compared to say the corporate industry where there's raises because of the cost of living every year. So there's a lot of teachers who feel not just demoralized, but at the same time, they're there for the right reasons. They continue to teach. They know that the, the kids need us. They know that we're connecting the dots a lot of the times every day to help these kids re reach their optimal level of success in the pathways that they're choosing. I, fortunately enough, have a lot of seniors, actually a lot to me, there's about four that come to my mind that want to be teachers. A lot of times they're looking to be lawyers, doctors, and that type of thing, but I have four strong students that are wanting to be educators. And they actually did their senior exits on that. So a lot of the times it's like, okay, we hear about this pipeline squeeze and, and, and things of that nature, but from a teacher's standpoint, I think it's very much needed to look at the issues, the, the value that we add on that front line dealing with these kids every day. So I'm, I'm really glad um, from the teacher perspective to hear um, what he had to say. And I think it's important that we know and understand that the opportunity to retain teachers has to be equally important with recruiting. Um, and one of the things that we've learned um, through um, a, a generous grant from the Belk Foundation is that we need to create pathways for our teachers to see ways that they can remain in the classroom, be compensated appropriately for taking on additional responsibilities, whether that's coaching other teachers or touching more kids if they are a particularly high impact teacher. And one of the things we learned uh, from some work in Project Live is that when we created teacher leadership positions, uh, we had 22 vacancies, we had over 600 candidates from around the nation apply for 22 positions. And what that told us is that money does matter, uh, but so does a pathway for teachers to see that they can remain in the classroom touching kids every day and yet advance professionally in terms of additional responsibility, increased roles, um, but still have a high impact on students, which is what we need <coughs> uh, So the, the takeaway from that is we need to think about pathways for teachers that have currently chosen this amazing profession and then in turn, we can use that as a recruiting tool to say to incoming teachers, here's some possible pathways that you can take as you think about coming in to this particular school district. From a national level, one of the things that we have to understand is the recruitment game has changed in, in education. Uh, before, we would see education as the number one career option of, of many college graduates. But now, given that so many other opportunities are out there, we have to be more strategic in what we're doing in today's recruitment mechanism. So, for example, here are some things that are working around the country that I think we ought to pay attention to uh, as well. So first, uh, when we look at recruitment uh, in, in days and time of limited budgets, like you said, A, you have a small recruitment staff. Many school districts, i.e. Houston, uh, Dallas, and many other areas around the country have have launched strategic social media campaigns around recruitment. So for example, you know how when you go to Google and you do Google, you see Google ads for those ads on the right, uh, they have certain targets where we want to identify people in these cities in the age ranges of this say 21 to age 30. And anytime that they do any kind of search, they will see an ad on the side, become a teacher at Charlotte Mecklenburg School. And, and, and things of that nature, it's very strategic around that because from that point, you don't have to spend a tremendous amount of dollars flying a recruitment staff around the country all the time because you're getting them every time that they come 
uh, to that particular search. So uh, these are the types of things that are going on now where recruitment has become really intentional to do that. And then when they click on the link, uh, the marketing staff of many of those school districts now have you know, two to three minute clips about why you should become a teacher in that particular school district. And one of the things we have to understand that salary is important, it's very important for many people, but it's not the top reason that people choose to become a teacher. Because uh, the research that I've done shows that uh, these particular candidates want to uh, give back to their communities, look at helping young people like you heard our panelists say, and many school districts have understood that and they play to that recruitment mechanism of how you can get back in that particular community. So these are a few of the strategies, and I'll say some others later, that are going on around the country. That's a perfect pivot to my next question, and I'll start with Keith, and, and we can work our way down. It's, it's about solutions, so we've heard some of the problems, and this is going to be a little bit of a tease for the rest of the conversation, but I'd like to start with Keith with, what are some things that we as a state, we as a school district, we as a community can do to incentivize people to, to go into the teaching profession uh, to address the teacher pipeline? Well, that's, that, I mean, that really is the heart of the, that's really the question, right? I mean, we've got, and I, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate the other panelists mentioning that Salary. It gets a lot of attention in the media, and it should. I mean, it's one of the factors when you look at uh, average teacher salary per people spending. It is something that you can actually compare from state to state, and certainly when you look at um, regional com uh, competitiveness, the salary is important. But I think it doesn't point out others. Folks don't go into teaching for the money. <laughs> Thankfully, right? <laughs> we, we, we probably have a bigger issue than we have. A lot of people who go into teaching, uh, they're not members of my family who are in teaching. I mean, they talk about it almost like a call, you know, like being called into the ministry, but uh, unfortunately they, uh, uh, they also seem to be taking about poverty too. But what, what we hear from teachers is not just issues about base salary, it's about the lack of respect and the professional support that they get as teachers. We're here at this wonderful company, Piedmont Natural Gas, today. Uh, I worked in the energy sector myself for several years. I can guarantee you that there's not a single professional in this building um, that has to go out and buy their own office supplies in the summer before their school starts, or put a uh, or put out an appeal on a GoFundMe site in order to pay for their next project. You know, Stephen Colbert, I'm a big fan. I'm sure you probably saw his recent uh, uh, commencement address at Wake Forest. Well, it was it was a cool story. He's from South Carolina, as you may know, and he had um, had noticed that a lot of uh, South Carolina teachers had listed projects and things they were trying to do in their classroom on a, a GoFundMe site. Decided to go ahead and fund all of them. Uh, it was eight hundred thousand dollars, and so I shared that story on Facebook and some other places. I thought, you know, this is it's really cool of him. I always liked him anyway, so I thought it was one, one more sort of checkbox for him. But then I thought, that, doesn't that really stink that our teachers have to go online to raise money for their own classrooms? I mean, that's what my sister has to do. Um, she's been she's entering her twentieth year of teaching, and so she talks about uh, things like the lack of support within the classroom, the fact that they don't have teachers. 7,000 fewer teachers assistants today than we had four years ago. And watch what's going on in the budget battle in Raleigh. We've only seen one side of the um, proposal from the House side, but I can tell you there's a, there is a lot of interest and discussion about eliminating teachers assistants completely. Um, so we, we talk about teachers assistants, we talk about class size, textbook funding. Again, there's a proposal on the House side to increase that, but we went from $112 per student to $12 per student. Average textbook costs 60 bucks. Um, so we've got teachers that are having to, um, you know, having to Xerox um, pages out of old books and pass them out. And then in some cases, those teachers have um, the principal has a little clicker, you know, like one of those old coaches' clickers to keep up with how many copiers, copies they are making, and they get fussed at when they make too many copies. I mean, is that how? It, and so, are we surprised that teachers feel devalued and don't feel like they're being treated as professionals? And then, you know, then you sort of throw those other things that have been happening with the public schools, and then you layer in, this is really kind of getting off subject, Bill, but the, uh, the A to F school grading, because I, I look at something like that and say, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna make your class size bigger, we're gonna take away your resources, we're gonna take away your TAs, and we're gonna take away professional development and support. Oh, by the way, but we're gonna put a, um, you know, a D or an F on the front door of your school because you serve a challenging population. Um, That's I, our last meeting, actually. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I just, I, I mean, I, I, I can get on a roll on things like this, but it really bothers me because I feel like that our public school teachers and everyone on this panel, I think, except for me, has taught in a classroom in their career, and you know, to me, they're heroes because what they're doing every day, uh, with fewer resources and a more diverse student population than we've ever had before, um, they're doing an amazing job. And I think, as a state, being a native North Carolinian. I feel like that we, not just in the last four years, but in the last decade or so, we have really taken our eye off the ball on education. Um, you know, our public schools aren't failing. Uh, uh, we're failing our public schools. Bill? Adam, uh, I really appreciate you getting right down to brass tacks and asking us about potential solutions. I want to stop for a minute and take off my maquette hat and put my old principal hat on. The most important thing that I ever did as a principal was to hire a teacher. The second most important thing I did was to keep teachers. Now, as many people say, people don't, young people don't go into the profession of teaching for the salaries. But I'd also like to add to that that they don't stay in the profession also because of the salaries. People need to have hope. They need to have hope that when they work hard, they're going to be rewarded for it. And when you look at some of those slides, like the one that CMS put together that shows the net decrease take home pay that teachers have had year after year after year, that devastates hope. And we have to provide some hope. So what are some specific su suggestions or solutions? Number one is to do away with the teaching fellows program was just, I think, the biggest mistake we ever could have made. As a former principal, the young people in my school right down the street here that applied for the teaching fellows scholarships were some of the best and brightest kids that I had. They wanted to become teachers. It was a, an honor to be a teaching fellow. And the teaching fellows, many of them, are still in the profession. Now, I know they get compared to Teach for America, and my friend Tim Hurley is here today from Teach for America. And Teach for America, let's not forget, has been wildly successful at what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to bring teachers in for two or three years. They do that very well. I believe that we need to have teachers to stay in the profession 5, 10, 15, 20 years. My school at Myers Park, the reason we had such a great staff is because we had a number of teachers that had 20 to 30 years of experience, 10 to 20 years of experience. We had some newbies. You go into many of our high poverty schools in CMS right now, it's a bunch of young kids. The culture has to be built. It takes time. It takes teachers of all different levels. So I think one thing we could do very easily is bring back a teaching fellows program, a teaching fellows like programs at different universities. Um, we touched on a little bit around the opportunity culture. Um, we need to provide other career pathways for teachers so they don't have to leave the classroom and become assistant principals or principals. And nothing wrong with assistant principals or principals, but Many of our young people, they see that as their only path if they're going to stay in the profession. Um, pay for performance legislation. As a former principal, I, did, I had no control over rewarding some of my best teachers. And CMS, a few years ago, put together a fantastic pay for performance program. I don't know what we called it. It was called something else. And it's on a shelf right now. But it was teachers deciding what really mattered. And it was all about multiple measures and how we can reward people. So there are a lot of things we can do, and we'll talk later in our panel this morning and our, about a call to action. There are many things we can do, but sitting still and just allowing this to take place is not the best solution. So just to follow up on what Bill said uh, about these teacher leadership roles, uh, about two weeks ago I had an assistant principal, I mean a principal call me very concerned because um, teacher had turned down an assistant principal job at his school um, and that uh, teacher was one of our teacher leaders who was making um, an additional twenty thousand dollars more uh, for taking on a teacher leadership role in her school and that principal was really upset I said I can't believe that we have teachers that are making more than assistant principals and I said you have just made my day <laughs> that is exactly why we engaged in this work about creating teacher leadership positions so that we could keep our very best teachers in the classroom. And we're looking to expand this to additional schools, so you need to get ready. Um, we're going to have um, principals in some of our schools making more than their supervisors. We 
we have got to prioritize the positions in schools, teachers first and foremost, but also the leaders of schools. Uh, and we know that there, and Chance can certainly tell us, there are schools that are a heavier lift uh, than others. And so we need to be prepared as a community, a state, um, to uh, compensate uh, our, our folks that carry a heavier load more money. Um, I'm a native North Carolinian as well. Uh, and I'm going to tell this audience this morning that my recruiting strategy is to recruit teachers from other counties in North Carolina because I can't compete with Houston. I can't re compete with their social media. Because if I were to do what Houston was doing to social media, we are using social media, I can't put a salary out there that allows me to be competitive. Ten years ago, CMS could have recruited from any part of this country. We can no longer do that. Now we are blessed to have an amazing community with the Panthers and the Hornets and the Checkers and the Whitewater Rafting and Carowinds and arts and museums. So we're able to recruit people from Greenville, North Carolina. But is that a strategy that we're excited about? Not in Clark as a native North Carolinian. That doesn't show much promise for the state of North Carolina in public education. It might solve some of our challenges in terms of recruiting but certainly not, it's not a good long-term strategy for us or for the state of North Carolina. So I really invite folks, I mean, if I, if I ask this audience to raise your hand, if you could raise a family on $35,000, I dare say few people in this room would raise their hands. We've been having this conversation as a state and as a nation for over a decade, and very little has changed. Now, I want to be clear, we need to applaud what's happened in the General Assembly in terms of moving our base pay from 31 to 35. That is not insignificant, and I am absolutely thrilled. But if we in any way think we're done, we are not. Because we are failing our public school systems. But the message our teachers are getting is absolutely that we are failing. They are failing. And that cannot be the message. And so, um, while I am really clear, I'm responsible for Mecklenburg County and the children in this community, I grew up in Gilbert County, and I care about the state. And so the solution is a state solution. It's not a local solution. We can have some solution here in Mecklenburg County because we have local funding and we're blessed with you know, support from our commissioners for public education. But the solution is it's a state solution. And so clarity from everyone in here about the need to focus on that state solution and to see a role you have. Everyone in here touches 100 people a week. Sometimes it's the same 100 people every week. And the people you touch, touch 100 more. We can have an influence, the people in this room, or the people making decisions, and raising their hands in Raleigh, and raising their hands here in Charlotte, but if we leave here thinking we have no influence, uh, then we're back here a year from now having a conversation that's more dire around our teacher pipeline. There are solutions. There are decision makers who raise their hands for budgets. Uh, and so we need to collectively and individually own the influence that we individually have and collectively the power of what we have. That's a great point to turn it loose to the audience. Uh, for your questions, uh, raise your hands. Uh, we'll try to move as quickly as we can to the audience. I saw John take the hand first. We'll start back in that. Okay, everybody up there is somewhat conflicted. Um, I love each of you. I don't know some of those teachers, and I got great respect for what you do. I'm no longer conflicted. I'm off the school of education. I'm retiring. Look at the numbers that were shown up there this morning. Look at where the tide turned. Folks, the problem is the general assembly. And it is about money. And uh, if you go back 10 years ago, and I'm going to tell you, we could recruit, we could recruit very effectively. And if you pull that multi-state chart out, where we're the lowest of the five, we weren't the lowest of the five then, we were leading. You don't have to go back to 2006. We were at the national average, very close to it. You saw we plummeted 14% for the worst of the nation in terms of how we treated our teachers. There's a lot said, and I'm not going to pick on 
people like the governor, people like the speaker of the house, people like Senate Pro Tem chair. Uh, but the bottom line is education, K-12, is not a priority in this state. Yeah, we bumped to 35, but as Ms. Clark has said in a very uh, appropriate way, not to offend anybody, the, the, the kick to 35 was great, but folks, the objective needs to be to get us to the national average. It needs to be to have a decent living wage, as Ann has alluded to, until such time as we can attract and retain good people in the profession, treat the profession with respect. Right now, it's hurting. It's the reason schools are not able to recruit effectively. It's the reason people are leaving the profession. And I know this is not all about money. Um, personally, I applaud the accountability issues, holding people accountable to do the jobs. But good grief, we've got to support people. And at the end of the day, if we don't have the kind of quality in the profession, we're not going to teach our kids. And if we don't teach our kids, I guarantee you, if we think we've got a problem with the teacher pipeline, we're going to have a real serious problem in terms of a workforce development issue. And ultimately, the economy of this state, in my humble opinion, resides right here with K-12 and the quality of people we have teaching our kids. And if we keep people in North Carolina and we grow our state the way we should. I apologize, but this is a partisan issue right now. And let the people in Raleigh know how you feel. The only way we're going to change this stuff is because they're saying that things are great. They're saying everything's great. We're giving the teachers a great lift. We're doing X, we're doing Y, we're doing Z. You saw the numbers this morning. It ain't working. Well, I think if I could just, just, just to add on just something that Josh said, I appreciate your comments. You know, we are, um, we do think it's important that your voices be heard. Um, in Raleigh. I mean, I think that is incredibly important because we think that uh, there's no more important investment that we can make as a state than in education. And look, I spent, before I joined the public school forum, I spent the last 20 years on the corporate side. Um, and I actually worked in economic development and site selection at one point in my career. And these, these issues matter. I mean, North Carolina right now has a bit of a brand problem when it comes to recruiting companies. And I know you can read about the, the fights over incentives and JDIG and things like that. Those are like, those are real. I mean, companies, look, they're going to take the money to get that money. Um, but we know from the folks who were involved in negotiations that Mercedes-Benz asked about North Carolina's commitment to education, that Volvo asked about North Carolina's commitment to education. Uh, we got, um, I, was, I was talking to our uh, state super school superintendent, June Atkinson, the other week, and she had just met with uh, Department of Defense officials who were looking at making decisions on where um, military bases are going to be closed or expanded, and they specifically ask about our per pupil investment and whether the soldiers who would be placed in North Carolina would have the support for their kids out in the community, and they ask about standards. And would there be academic standards in North Carolina that would be transferable and relevant in other states if they moved around? So these things matter when it comes to jobs, and it's not just about the teacher's salary, but it, it is certainly part of it. John, John, your comments, I'd like to add uh, one little comment. There are two statistics that I think are incredibly important. In 2008, North Carolina ranked 25th in the nation in average teacher salaries. We are now 42nd in average teacher salaries. Over the past 11 years, when you look at raises for teachers, that was one of Keith's slides, we are dead last in what we're doing for our teachers. Principal had one again. When teachers came to my office and told me, I can't continue to do this, I love teaching, but I can't support my family, uh, there were two things that bothered me. Number one was salary, and number two is working conditions. And working conditions is code for class size. Class size costs money. And Clark said it very clearly, it's a state issue. It is a state responsibility. Sure, the county helps a lot, but we really need to look at class sizes, and we need to look at competitive salaries. I remember when I was a teacher, and I loved being a teacher. We used to make fun of South Carolina, but oh, we could have South Carolina and teach. Not anymore. Uh, we have, and that makes CMS especially susceptible, I think, because folks can jump on 77, they can go down to New York, and they can go to Rock Hill, and they can make $10,000 more a year just by driving 20 minutes. 
keeping their home in Charlotte. So salaries do matter, uh, working conditions do matter. Uh, John, again, thank you. Hi, I'm Judy McDonald. I'm a uh, education professor over at Belmont Abbey College. We work with CMS quite a bit. Um, we love it. My concern is I work with K6. I am a STEM teacher, and my big concern right now is, and we haven't talked about it, we're talking about recruitment, we're talking about retention. There's a new test that our teachers are taking. They are no longer taking the Praxis II to enter the field. And most people don't know about this. They are, they are taking the NCTEL, which is modeled after the Massachusetts test. Somebody in the state thought this would be a good idea. Um, we had a 100% pass rate at our school. Right now, this is the first year that the test and the first semester that this test has been offered. Right now, we're at about 60% pass rate. It's not to say that those students won't retake and retest and pass and move into schools um, here in North Carolina. But we've had two of our students come to us directly and say, we're not even going to take the test. We're going to South Carolina. We're taking the test there, and we're going to go straight to their schools. So we've got a problem there um, that hasn't been addressed, and most people don't even know about it. Unless you're a lot of people shaking their heads but it's something we need to get out there as well because like Ann said we are going to have a big problem and a lot of it's going to stem in our elementary with a lack of teachers and what will happen is we are going to get unfortunately sort of the bottom of the barrel I believe with this new policy so what do you think?
you know, then they want to know from their building principal or whoever, what kind of support am I going to get to one, survive and do the quality job that I want to do? And if they feel they have that perceived support, the tension rates will always be higher. Or you look at new teachers, years one to three, you know, they look at many times they're often assigned to many challenging schools with uh, the most challenging students and in the most challenging class assignments across the nation. So I know one of the things that working with the CMS, you know, I know they've done a lot to alleviate that, but when you look at the perceived support in that, that is what happens when you look at retention of teachers because it comes down to their day-to-day -day reality inside of the classroom. Do I have the support I need at my school site so I can be the kind of teacher that I want to be? And that may be from the standpoint of uh, operating around uh, changing teaching teaching schedules where I can teach a smaller class, you know, maybe in alternative semesters. Or I have, like you said, a system or I team teach with another teacher where I don't have to share the burden of all 35 students, you know, myself. So these are the things that we have to understand when it comes to retention across the country. It's all about real support financially, but also perceived support inside of that school building and the help that I'm getting on a day-to-day -day basis. So I guess I would just want to pose a question to the audience. What would you do if you were the superintendent of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools? You had many amazing teachers <coughs> like this Mecca, teacher of excellence in your school district. You saw the slide with the $35,000 salary and the net reduction of $1,366 just with health benefits, not even gas, food, housing, other things. Um, and you have a choice. Do you advance a salary increase recommendation to your Board of Education and then ultimately to your county commissioners? And know that you risk great teachers seeing that not advance. So you advance it so that your teachers are clear as a superintendent that you know there is a, a critical need. And then as a Board of Education member, what do you do? And then as a county commissioner. Um, I can argue all day long that it's not locally our responsibility um, to increase teacher salaries. But I'm equally clear that Guilford County is not going to take care of our employees. <coughs> so that is the dilemma you face as a superintendent. The unintended messages to this amazing teacher to my left if I don't advance, if our board doesn't approve, but then the risk that there won't be approval ultimately where the approval has to happen sends another message back. And so back, back to what Chance was talking about in terms of perception uh, of, of support for public education for the role of the teacher more specifically since that's our focus this morning. So I just want you to think about what you would do when ultimately it, it's about an important message to teachers. And yeah. that's the tension that we face. Um, we as superintendents and elected officials is, is the unintended consequences of decisions we make at those three levels um, send a very powerful message um, to our teachers. I was just going to add that real quick. I appreciate Ann's uh, candor earlier about her concerns about going after teachers from other counties because as looking at it from the state perspective, that is one of the areas. Look, pitting counties versus counties is not a, a long-term viable strategy for our state. Um, one of the things that you, you, I think what you're hearing from all the panels is there's not one single um, silver bullet that's going to if we, if we were to raise our teacher salaries tomorrow to the national average, it's not going to address some of the issues. I think we want, I mean, Bill talked about and Chance talked about the retention, it's a lot cheaper to retain the teachers that we have who are already skilled and experienced, but we left them out of the pay increases last year. But we need to do something to help support those veteran teachers. Beginning teachers have a whole different set of issues. They need some additional supports in their early years, um, mentors, um, chances of network. We're doing some work in Wake County to support beginning teachers, and we're trying to do that across the state. That's something that we think that we can do. We've got to also increase the uh, sort of entryways into teaching. We talked about the Teaching Fellows Program. We talked about Teach for America. Both great programs, alternative entry programs, uh, faster certification, other ways for people who came out of, I think you said you came out of the banking business to get into teaching. I mean, those things are all great because there's not going to be just one single way to do it. Uh, but I think that overall supporting the, 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 the teaching
teaching profession for what it means for our state is going to help us with all those factors, both retention and testing. Can I, can I just add also from my standpoint, being in the classroom, you, you, you have different areas. You have the, uh, different content areas and you have the area that I teach in, which is CTE, Career and Technical Education. We have continued support in our area. You know, since I started nine years ago, um, paper and all those issues for other teachers are an issue, but for us, we don't. We have uh, technology support from a business um, informational technology standpoint. They make it available for us. So a lot of our argument isn't necessarily from that support. It's, it's basically for all teachers because they might see that we have it, but then again, they're like, how come we don't have it? You know, so to keep it on an even keel, you know, how can we continue to do that? And, and not necessarily how do we do it, we need to do it. Because if not, teachers start looking at, well, you know, I'm not as valued as other teachers. The CPE teachers get it all, and, you know, that type of thing. But we're greatly supported, though, in, in that area. And, and I'm thankful for that because our kids need it. I teach, um, some of my classes are not textbooks. They're, they're from um, online, which is a National Academy Foundation. It's online, we use the technology. And the one great piece about that is, kids get to use, um, get to use cutting edge technology. And on top of that, we need a lot of paper. So, but when our need is there, we get it. But other teachers, it may not be that sufficient. Okay, we've got lots of questions on deck. I've seen lots of hands, so we're gonna move in the following order. Yes, ma'am, we're gonna start with you, then we're gonna go to Rhonda, then we're gonna go to Kay, then we're gonna go to Ellen. I'd like to remind our questioners to keep your questions short. I'd like to remind our panelists to keep your answers short so we can try to get to as many people as we can. Good, I'll keep mine. Uh, very short. Yolita Moser, I'm the Latin American Women's Association. Uh, and I'm sure this is already out there. But just uh, speaking of the impact at state level, uh, is there a study that has been done to show the impact of education monetarily into the lives of the children, the students that we address? To me, it is quite important. I come from a country where if there is an issue like this, teachers will go on strike. Mm -hmm. And the influence of teachers striking into the lives, the everyday lives of citizens is very clearly accounted. Teachers are very well regarded and well paid. So my question is directly to numbers. Indeed, the economic impact of teachers Attracting uh, people at, at our state, not even uh, here in Mecklenburg County, is so critical for me at least to, to have something very specific, just like the statistics that you show. What would be the impact if the teacher uh, continues to be absent because of lack of pay in our in the lives of our uh, students? I'll start and then I know Chance and others will have more of the statistics, but I'll just speak to the fact that I've gone on record and ask what's keeping me up at night, my answer to this community should be student achievement. But until I can be clear that we, we collectively have solved for this teacher pipeline, that is what is keeping me up at night because I know I can't deliver an on grade level fourth grader to this community and most importantly to our kids without incredible teachers. And I know that sounds really corny uh, but at the end of the day, we put a stake in the sand in this community about delivering on grade level fourth graders at the beginning of their year. Why fourth grade? In fourth grade, you start reading to learn. You've got to have learned to read. And so for me, uh, as it relates to statistics and other things, I've had to realize if I don't go out clearly and put a stake in the sand in front of this community and the state around our teacher pipeline, and I have no capacity to deliver on a commitment I believe I've made, not believe I've made, I have made, along with many, to address literacy. So at a very basic level, if we're hearing that we're going to have challenges with elementary teachers, that's been the least of our worries historically. It's been in the STEM fields. It's been in special education. It's been in foreign languages. To hear now that we have a crisis on, on the horizon with our elementary teachers, should be a concern to everyone. So uh, I'll defer to some panel members for some additional statistics. I think you raise a great question. Well, from, from my end, the research is clear real brief. The more education a student receives, the more earning power they have. So if they get the equivalent of a high school diploma, the average lifetime earnings are a little bit 
less than a million dollars and it grows exponentially per degree attainment over two million, three million dollars over the course of their, their working lives. So it is clear that education makes the difference. The, the thing that we have to understand is that as society continues to evolve, uh, college degrees, career and technical degrees are gonna be the new high school diplomas. Mm -hmm. You know, so as we look at the high school diploma and this place in society, it's just a must have in this day and age because you know, the transition of what companies and uh, employees want nowadays. So, you know, the education part of it is key in the economic development of what we're talking about for the state. Rhonda. Hey, Rhonda Lennon from the school board, and I'm with Anna 100% on pretty much everything she's ever said. But what I'd like to say is we're not talking just about salaries because, Mr. Tate, you're correct. We need to impact Raleigh. We need to advocate for our teachers and for the pay. But the other part is the retention, not just class size. So what as business leaders and community leaders can we do to take the message out to this community so they will embrace public education? It's not about giving them more money to the PTA. It's not about handing them a check. What we're doing in North Mecklenburg is we've got a group called Lake Norman PIE, Partners in Education, and it's something that we're modeling after the Cobb County model. McClinton Partners in Education is a great example. We don't just go to a business and say, we need you to get involved and we need you to love public education. We need you not to have that look on your face when a student says, I want to be a teacher someday. We need you to have that happy face like Ann said. And I had to have that happy face two weeks ago when my 23-year-old who's been bouncing around trying to figure out what she wanted to do when she grew up told me, I want to be a Spanish teacher. And I went, cool. Oh dear, but cool, you know? <laughs> but what I'm saying is as business community, we don't want you just to give money to the PTA. We want to try to match you up. So we need to find a way in Mecklenburg County to harness the energy and the passion for public education that our business leaders obviously have and turn it into actual feet on the street in our school. So what we're doing, we've got a couple law firms up there. They're actually mentoring our debate teams. They're going in and they're helping with the civics and economics courses. They're doing what you said. They're not just giving pads of paper, but they're giving you the technology. They're giving you tools to make your job in the classroom easier so that the other issues like pay and salary and benefit costs going up are not as overwhelming. When you know you have the support of everybody around you, that undergirding, a foundation of support, your job becomes incredibly easier. So we need to figure out a way as this community, not just to keep writing checks, but to put our feet on the street and get in and help the schools. And so what we're doing in Lake Norman areas, we're actually surveying schools. What do you actually need? You don't just need pads of paper. We've got a group called E2D, Eliminate the Digital Divide, out of Davidson. It started up there with, I can't remember the big company. I now I can't even remember it, but a few business leaders started it and now they have equipped every low income student in seven schools with computers and hooked up wireless technology for their families at home. They didn't just write checks, they put it together and now at Ada Jenkins Center every week those families are going in and getting computer literacy to learn how to use that technology. So we need to find a way with your direction of how to harness that energy that's in this community and turn it into real activity for our schools. That's my little speech. <laughs> I did survey groups on the school board and I was ancient history through 2011, but I do serve as a member of the Public School Policy Forum, and, and I'm also a student at Northeastern, <laughs> so I'm back, back to the books again. But my comments and, and question to answer or to add to the conversation, uh, Superintendent and Clark, first I want to applaud you for your leadership as superintendent. Our, our community is well appreciative of your efforts. When you look at uh, recruitment and retention, I think back to our HR departments. And to me, I think that's where we need to look as, as one element. I mean, you've covered an awful lot of elements that need to be looked into. But the HR department, uh, that to me is where you've always heard, you know, out of state teachers have to jump through hoops. You know, they want to teach here, you have people that come to North Carolina, their spouses can't work here. As teachers because they have to jump in groups. You have, um, I think the pathways for teaching is wonderful and, and I think that is something that we've well needed for a long, long time. 
And I think that another concern is the permanent subs. We have too many schools. At one school, they told me they had 10 permanent subs. Uh, that meant those teachers, those students have no teacher. So that, to me, it goes right back to the HR department. How are we, are we being more efficient? I know there have been some changes in there, but that's one area I think that also needs to be looked into. The other, when you think about recruiting, Teach for America has been masters at recruiting for many, many years. Uh, and yes, they don't, don't recruit uh, majors in education, but they recruit the best and the brightest in America. And they're good at recruiting. I have a niece that is top two years Teach for America in Memphis. She's now went back for two masters in education. And she is guidance counselor at a high school in Greenville, North Carolina helping the same students she taught in Memphis. But that's what Teach for America does. They get you inspired to do that, and they catch you after you're graduate from college so that you have that maturity, perhaps, to pick up the rest of it. So to me, look at how they're recruiting. It seems like there ought to be more a bigger partnership. I know we have a partnership, but it needs to be bigger. Because that merging, yes, their training might not be six weeks is not enough. But come on, take those College of Educations and take Teach for America for what they're doing now and expand on it. Uh, so that's another thought. And then the other, I was at West Mecklenburg High School a couple weeks ago. I spent the morning in a Teach for America classroom. Uh, and they only teach in Title I schools or Title I kids that are. But, you know, to listen to this teacher, Respect is what you hear teachers leave. They're not putting up with this garbage with the students. And especially in high school, middle school, there's, there's a two-way street there. But you hear this teacher, they, she calls her students, ladies and gentlemen. And when you hear this, okay, it's a two-way street. She earns the respect of those students. And, and it's just phenomenal to listen to that. But it, it's the respect. And yes, she is coming back for a third year next year. So it does happen. And the last thing, <laughs> digital learning plan. I heard that was going to be number one. North Carolina is going to be number one in the nation. Is that not another tool that will help knowing teachers will have that as a tool to come into North Carolina to teach? So I'll take a step just real quickly at several of those points. Um, I'm happy to report that two years ago, CMS recruited someone for Teach for America to lead our recruiting team. And she, in turn, did a brilliant job of recruiting her replacement. Um, and then three years ago, we didn't even have a recruiting team in CMS. I'm embarrassed to report a dedicated team specifically to recruiting. And our recruiting team is here today because they've now learned that I'm going to be asking every audience to give them a contact of a teacher you know somewhere in the United States or abroad, and they're prepared to show you that there are not as many hoops um, as perhaps there have been, and you are absolutely correct that we made it very challenging to bring someone into the state of North Carolina due to licensure and, and other, other challenges. Uh, that, I can't say we've solved that, but it's a lot better. Um, and then finally, I would say that you are correct that um, um, our digital resources, specifically here in Charlotte, are an asset. We can right now tell any middle school teacher that if you come into Charlotte Mecklenburg, every single one of your students is going to have a device. That's a game changer in terms of how you think about teaching as a middle school teacher, and we might argue one of the toughest grade level spans to, to teach. Um, we will be expanding that to ninth and 10th grade next year and to hopefully 5th grade. So uh, over the next three years, we would have a plan to get a device in the hands of every single student through uh, efforts such as E2D2 and our own uh, investments here locally. And so I absolutely do think it's a recruiting tool because there are very few large urban districts in this country that can say they're one to one. Uh, but I would also say to our higher ed partners here in the room, we need teachers prepared to teach a classroom full of kids who are very well acquainted with technology and have a device in their hands. So uh, there needs to be um, a dual effort there as well. This question is really for Keith, but any of you can answer it. Um, you mentioned the North Carolina Teacher Support Program, and 
And I, I know the numbers show that teachers who get that kind of support do stay a little longer. And I wondered from your understanding, what's going on there? What makes the difference when teachers get that kind of support in their first, second, and third year? Well, we sort of, the research is pretty clear that there is a, a direct linkage between uh, professional development and retention. I mean, and that's actually, I mean, I think that's, that's true in any company. I think if you know, those of you who work in the private sector, I think if you feel like your employer is investing in you and providing the support, particularly for um, beginning teachers who are coming out of the schools of education, there's a big difference in, um, even if they had, they obviously went through some uh, level of student teaching. One of the things we liked about the Teaching Fellows Program is that it got teachers into the classrooms early. But it's still a big difference. I see my friend James back here, our teacher of the year. It's a big difference in what you learn in the classrooms and when you're actually standing up there um, and, and having to learn how to, to manage a classroom of, of, of kids. And so those, those beginning teachers, I think, have some unique um, uh, culture shocks of sort of what they have to go through. They, the ones that we work with in Wake County, they want to learn about um, sort of, sort of you know, classroom management things together. They want to talk about curriculum development. They want to talk about how to implement the standards. They don't want to see the standards change again um, every two or three years. But, but one of the things about those beginning teachers, I mean, they're very much like the kids that are coming up now. They're sort of digital natives. I mean, they're kind of used to having real-time communications and training and support. We, it's fun. We, we, we'll meet with these beginning teachers and they talk about uh, wanting to learn about something. They don't say, well, we want to go to this workshop in September. No, they'll, they'll go home at night, watch something on YouTube, post it on the social media share sites and talk to each other and have a Twitch chat about it before the next meeting. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to support and connect them together. So it certainly is, I think it's true for all teachers, but particularly with these new teachers. I'm, I mean, I'm in awe of the ones who are going to the profession right now, knowing some of the lack of uh, support and some of the challenges they have. And certainly from a beginning teacher perspective, uh, the turnover rates are uh, in excess of 20%. We've heard some numbers that in the first five years we lose 50%. Maybe a little on the high side, but certainly I mean, you saw one of the slides I put up. The, the turnover rate for beginning teachers in their first three years is more than 20%. So again, one of the messages I hope that you're taking from today is that uh, when you have an opportunity to talk to elected officials and others in the community, is that the teacher pipeline uh, issue is real. We need to have, we need to address retention, and that's why I mentioned I think that the idea of career pathways for teachers, like the model that's happening here at CM, CMS, is a good idea. Some of the pay issues we talked about is a good idea. Additional professional development and support is a good idea. There's a lots of good ideas, but we need to get about it. Um, we need to stop saying that it's our most important priority and actually do it. Um, because I think that uh, from the business perspective, I love what you're talking about with the businesses helping the individual schools, and we need to continue to build those communities around our schools. That's important. But what I really need is for business people to tell our elected officials that education is economic development. Um, that investing in education is really what we need more than anything else. And, you know, this is a real jargony word, but social mobility and the idea that our kids are going to be better than we did is, is at risk. We're sitting here in, this, in, a, in a wealthy community in Charlotte. I live in another wealthy, relatively wealthy community in Raleigh. Yeah, Chance, you probably saw the, the numbers just came out. Charlotte and Raleigh are now top five in the country in terms of poverty rate acceleration. And the reason why that is is the education gap. We're creating jobs, or one of the reasons, we're creating jobs that require higher skills, and yet we have students who can't take those jobs. And I, when I moved back to Raleigh from Atlanta in 2009, in the teeth of the recession, unemployment rate in, in the Raleigh area was, was about 10%. It was, it was approaching 10%. The unemployment rate for, uh, for students, for, for job seekers with a college degree was about two and a half percent. It never really got above three or four percent the whole time during that really that pit. So that gap between what is you know, what you can get with a high school diploma versus some college and a college degree is, is, is remarkable. And yet we argue over, the, over whether we should make college more accessible or not when it's clearly um, sort of the key to everything. We're going to make that the last word uh, because if I start doing more, we're going to run way over. Uh, let's thank our panelists for.